Well, we come now to the preaching of God's word, and we find ourselves in part six of our series on the kingdom of God. And what we've seen is this, that God is on a mission to bring about the restoration of all things. And this includes the restoration of Israel, the restoration of the Davidic throne, the restoration of the nations, and the restoration of creation itself at which time the kingdom of God will be the one and only kingdom and Christ will rule and reign from and over all of the earth. And we've seen that the precursor to this is a time of worldwide judgment known as the day of the Lord, which consists of a time of testing that will come upon the entire inhabited earth, Revelation 3.10. It will also include Israel's distress and divine chastening, cosmic signs in the heavens, Israel's divine deliverance at the second coming of Christ, judgment for those nations that went to war against her, and the establishment of Christ's kingdom, at which time the restoration of all things will dawn. And what that means is this, that there is an extended period of delay between the first coming of Christ and the judgment that results in the establishment of his kingdom. And this is a mystery that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament, but is revealed in the New Testament and specifically in the kingdom parables where Jesus depicts this extended period of delay. And so today, we're going to look at a number of kingdom parables and we're going to do so for the purpose of showing that the kingdom parables support the rest of Scripture and its expectation surrounding the kingdom of God. That we too would have a biblical expectation surrounding the nature and the arrival of God's kingdom and would clearly appreciate our mission between the two comings of Christ. And that leads us to Matthew 13 to Matthew 13, and you can turn there. Matthew 13 is a chapter that is devoted entirely to kingdom parables. It consists of eight parables. Again, each one relating to the kingdom of God. Four of the parables are expressed to the crowd with the disciples present. The other four are expressed privately to the disciples alone. In addition, Matthew records for us two explanations that Jesus gives to his disciples. Jesus explains the parable of the soils and he explains the parable of the wheat and the tares. And though we aren't going to dissect the first parable, we need to briefly summarize it to appreciate the significance of all of the parables. And the first parable is the parable of the soils, where there are four kinds of soil, with each representing a certain result or response to the hearing of the word of the kingdom. And of the four soils, only one bears fruit, and that to varying degrees, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. And this signals that the word of the kingdom is going to be rejected on a massive scale, which is consistent with what Jesus says elsewhere, that the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it, Matthew 7, 13. But though that be true, the word of the kingdom will nevertheless be fruitful so that those whose hearts consist of good soil will hear the word understand it, and go on to bear fruit. And when Jesus begins to speak to the crowds in parables, it puzzles his disciples. And they ask him in verse 10, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them in verse 11, to you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. So Jesus began speaking to the crowds in parables as a judgment to conceal the truth from them. 
And this comes out in verse 13, which says, therefore, I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. And so the idea is that since they wouldn't believe the plain preaching of Jesus, they would now get parables. And that as a judgment for their unbelief. And so again, the disciples are puzzled. I mean, this just is not quite going the way they would have expected it to go. Many were rejecting the message of the kingdom with only a few receiving it, and that didn't jive with their expectation surrounding the coming of Messiah and the kingdom of heaven. And for the record, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are synonymous. Refer to the same thing. And both refer to everything we've been seeing in the Old Testament. When the New Testament anticipates the kingdom of God and portrays the expectation of the disciples concerning that kingdom, they're anticipating the kingdom that we've been looking at in the Old Testament and is being reiterated now in the New. And you'll notice that in verse 11, Jesus refers to the mysteries of the kingdom, where he says to them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And the word mysteries refers to that which was previously hidden but has now been revealed or made known. Things which in other generations were not made known to the sons of men, to use the language of Ephesians 3.5. And so what Jesus reveals in Matthew 13 are new truths concerning the kingdom. Truths that account for the delay between the first coming of Christ and the judgment that takes place in accord with the establishment of his kingdom. And to appreciate this mystery from an Old Testament perspective, turn to Zechariah 9 for a moment, which doesn't mean going very far. Just Matthew, then to Malachi, then Zechariah. Second last book of the Old Testament. And we've seen a couple of examples of this already, but the example in Zechariah 9 makes the point. In Zechariah 9, there are two verses placed side by side. One that clearly depicts the first coming of Christ and one that remains yet unfulfilled and necessitates the second coming of Christ. And yet, from one verse to the next, there's really no indication within the context of the Old Testament that there would be any delay between the two. And you'll see that in these verses. So look at Zechariah 9, verse 9. It says there, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Pop quiz, when was that fulfilled? It was fulfilled in the first coming of Christ, at the triumphal entry. But then look at the very next verse, verse 10. It says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off and he will speak peace to the nations and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. When was that fulfilled? Well, the fact is it has not yet been fulfilled. And it hasn't been fulfilled because it's a reality that's inseparable from the establishment of Christ's kingdom, the very kingdom Zechariah goes on to describe in Zechariah 14. And so again, in two verses placed side by side, what was expected to take place in one coming would actually require two. And with hindsight being what it is, we now know that there are at least 2,000 years that, that provide the gap between the two comings. That's the mystery not previously revealed, but is now revealed in the parables of the kingdom. And so that's the purpose of the kingdom parables, to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom in light of the delay between the first coming of Messiah and the judgment that will result in the establishment of his kingdom. 
We're going to see that theme reiterated over and over again as we work through the text that we will. Now, let me outline how we're going to approach this. We're going to look at five of the eight kingdom parables. The parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven, the parable of the dragnet, and the parable of the scribe. And we're going to do that moving through them at a fairly brisk pace. And that means that we're skipping three of the eight parables, the parable of the soils, the parable of the hidden treasure, and the parable of the costly pearl. And we're going to do that to home in on only those parables that are critical to our expectations surrounding the arrival of the kingdom. From there, I'm going to take you to Luke 19 and another kingdom parable because it's one that beautifully illustrates our study of the kingdom of God. And if you are lacking clarity prior to Luke 19, Luke 19 should be the parable that will tie it all together and help you to understand what is taking place in this age at this moment. And so if you're taking notes, jot this down. The parable of the wheat and the tares. The parable of the wheat and the tares. And we're going to cover the parable and its explanation together in one. Now keep in mind, as we do this, you're going to have to bring with you all that we've seen so far. So you have a responsibility as a listener to call to mind, to recall all that we've been seeing, because this is going to supplement that. It's going to further furnish all of that and amplify it to be able to understand what's taking place with respect to the kingdom of God. And to appreciate the significance of this parable, you need to recall that the Old Testament's teaching on the kingdom of God depicts the Messiah coming and then judging the wicked and establishing his kingdom. That's the Old Testament expectation. Messiah comes, judges the wicked, and establishes his kingdom. And so a question that might be on the minds of the disciples at this point in time, with respect to them, well, with respect to Jesus speaking to the crowds in parables, is why speak to them this way? Why even bother speaking to them in parables? Why not just remove them in judgment and establish the kingdom? That would have been a consistent thing to do in light of Old Testament revelation. And the parable of the wheat and the tares answers that question and signals that both the righteous and the wicked will coexist until the end of the age and the establishment of the kingdom, which means there's a gap between the arrival of Christ and the expected judgment, which will take place, of course, at his second coming. And so let's look at the parable. And initially, we'll look at the parable proclaimed. Look at verse 24. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner, uh, the landowner rather, came and said to them, Sir, do you, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. There's the parable pro proclaimed. And just as a, a word of caution with respect to parables, you've got to be careful not to press every detail. Parables typically have one overarching aim in their intent. And we're benefited in this particular case because our Lord is going to give us an explanation in verses 36 to 43. But let's just make a few observations at the outset. One, 
Jesus is drawing a comparison between the kingdom of heaven and a man's wheat field. And again, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous. Two, over time, it becomes evident that there are tares growing among the wheat. And in the parable, the tares were sown by the man's enemy. Three, the slaves asked the owner if they should gather up the tares. And the owner says, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. And four, the wheat and the tares will grow together until the time of the harvest, at which point they will be separated and the tares will be burned up and the wheat will be gathered into the barn. That is the parable proclaimed. Now skip down to verse 36 and we'll see the parable explained. The parable explained. Look at verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. So now Jesus is with his disciples in the house. And his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, there are, these are the sons of the kingdom and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. So Jesus identifies all of the major players in this parable. The one who sows the good seed represents the son of man, Christ. The field represents the world, not the church, the world. The good seed represents the sons of the kingdom, kingdom citizens, those who receive the word of the kingdom. The tares represent the sons of the evil one, those who belong to the kingdom of darkness. The enemy represents Satan and the reapers represent angels. So the hard part is done. Verse 40, it says, so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. So there's the overarching point of the parable. That's the comparison being made in the same way that the tares are gathered up and burned at the time of the harvest, so it shall be for the sons of the evil one at the end of the age. The judgment will take place at the end of the age. Verse 41, it says, the son of man will send forth his angels. This is what takes place at his second coming. And they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So when Jesus returns with his kingdom, the first order of business on the docket is to judge the wicked, to gather out of his kingdom the lawless, all stumbling blocks, and to throw them into the fiery furnace, which is emblematic of hell, eternal punishment, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what Jesus describes here with respect to this parable is exactly what we see in Matthew 25, 31 and following, so turn there. And we've looked at this a couple of times in this series. But the way that the wheat and the tares and this declaration of what will take place in verse 31 of chapter 25 and following parallel one another exactly. Look at Matthew 25, verse 31. It says, but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now, which throne is that? Is that the throne of the Father? No, Christ is on the throne of the Father now. This is the Davidic throne. This is the moment David's throne is restored. Verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, as you think about the parallel between this and the wheat and the tares, in the context of that parable, what do the sheep represent? 
Wheat or tares? Wheat. And what do the goats represent? The tares. The sons of the evil one. And then it says in verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the kingdom is presented as an inheritance, something to inherit. And here the long awaited inheritance is finally realized. The kingdom is the inheritance. That's what Jesus says concerning the sheep. But then look at verse 41. As it relates to the goats, it says, he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Where these who are accursed and are called to depart from Jesus are one and the same with the lawless and the stumbling blocks that Jesus will remove from his kingdom in the parable of the wheat and the tares. And then skip down to verse 46. It says, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So when Christ comes, he will separate the wheat from the tares and will send the tares into eternal judgment, but will gather the wheat into his kingdom. The very kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. And then you have the final statement in the explanation back in Matthew 13 and verse 43, which says this, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He was ears, let him hear. And this is where your expectation concerning the kingdom of God must be firmly rooted in the Old Testament. Because otherwise, you might see the language in verse 43 that says in the kingdom of their father and conclude that this refers to the eternal kingdom, the eternal state, the new heaven, the new earth, that which is described in Revelation 21 and 22. But if it does, then there's a change in the kingdom program. And we haven't seen anything that would indicate a change. And so the kingdom of their father is one and the same as the kingdom of Christ, the very kingdom pictured in Matthew 25, verse 31. And that means that we can't make hard and fast distinctions between the two phases of the kingdom. For as Zechariah 14, 9 indicates that when Christ is reigning as king from and over all the earth, then it will be Yahweh who is king. Christ's kingdom and the Father's kingdom are essentially two phases of the same kingdom. And Christ will always be king through all of eternity. And so what's the point of the parable? That during this age, while the king is absent, both the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the evil one will coexist in the world, only to be separated at the second coming of Christ and the end of the age, at which time Christ will establish his kingdom from and over the earth. And that articulates a mystery a mystery of the kingdom that wasn't previously revealed, that there would be an entire age between the first coming of Christ and the judgment that would result in the establishment of his heavenly kingdom on earth at his second coming. And that until then, the sons of the kingdom would exist alongside the sons of the evil one. And just to help you apply that to now, That's what's going on right now. The world today consists of both the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the evil one. And we coexist in the world until the end of the age. That's the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now, second, the parable of the mustard seed. The parable of the mustard seed. And again, you've got to understand that these are parables. So as far as teaching tools, literary devices, this is not an epistle. And so there's there's an artfulness in the articulation of these parables, but you can't quite nail them down to the extent that you might want to, as you would in, say, an epistle that are very didactic in nature. 
But nevertheless, the parable of the mustard seed, verse 31, it says he presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. And so what do we have here? We have a comparison between the kingdom of heaven and a mustard seed. And a mustard seed was the smallest seed planted in the gardens of Palestine. And yet once full grown, it became a large tree. They say between 12 and 15 feet tall. And so the question for us is, how does that fit the context of Matthew 13, that you would have this small little mustard seed and that it would ultimately blossom into the largest tree in the garden? Well, it's picking up on the notion of a seemingly insignificant beginning. That at that time, the kingdom of heaven, the time that Jesus was, was with his, his disciples, was like a mustard seed consisting of not much more than Jesus and the 12. But just as the mustard seed, once full grown, becomes a tree larger than the rest of the plants of the garden, so too would the kingdom of God become a kingdom that towers above all other kingdoms. Because it would become so large that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches, which is an Old Testament reference to the nations being participants in the coming kingdom of God. A promise that's rooted all the way back in the Abrahamic covenant. Now, some believe that this parable teaches that at some point during this present age, prior to the second coming of Christ, that the gospel will have such an influence over the world that the world will be effectively Christianized. But you have to understand that's making this parable say far more than it's intended to say. That's making this parable walk around on all fours and this parable can't walk. It is here to reveal a very clear and profound truth concerning the kingdom of God. And even that understanding of this parable would necessitate a drastic change in God's kingdom program. And as we've seen, there is no reason to believe that God's kingdom program from the beginning, all the way back in Genesis, all the way to the end of Revelation has changed. It's consistent from Old Testament to New Testament. And it also fails to realize that the kingdom of heaven has the advantage of what? The resurrection that the kingdom of heaven consists of every believer throughout the ages, both Old Testament and New. So that the kingdom of heaven is never entirely summed up in any one generation. As if the state of the kingdom can only be evaluated by the present and assessing the kingdom of God as it is present in the world now. And so that's not what the parable is teaching. It's simply teaching that a seemingly insignificant beginning will in the end result in a massive kingdom. One that will represent some from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Revelation 5, 9. That's the parable of the mustard seed. And similar to that, because they go together, is this third parable that we're gonna look at. The parable of the leaven. The parable of the leaven. Look at verse 33. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leaven. And so what do we have here? We have the kingdom of heaven being compared to leaven that leavens a whole lump of dough. And given the explanation of the wheat and the tares, we can safely say that the dough represents what? The world. And so in the same way, 
that leaven leavens an entire lump of dough, the message of the kingdom, the gospel, will reach the four corners of the earth, guaranteeing two realities. One, that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, Matthew 24, 14. And two, that in the kingdom, again, every tribe, tongue, people, and nation will be represented, Revelation 5, 9. And so this is another parable that recognizes the seemingly insignificant beginnings that will ultimately give way to a vast kingdom where the gospel of the kingdom, which is likened to leaven, will spread throughout the whole world and will do so throughout this age until the second coming of Christ, the judgment of those who reject him and the establishment of his kingdom. And when you put the two together, both the parable of the wheat and the tares and the parable of the mustard seed, or rather the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven, what becomes clear is that in this age, the kingdom advances as the gospel of the kingdom advances and as the number of kingdom citizens increases. And so every time a person comes to Christ, the kingdom is growing. The kingdom citizens are increasing. The kingdom is advancing. And that means that on a human level, the advancement of the kingdom entirely hinges on the church and the Great Commission because it's the church that has been entrusted with the gospel of the kingdom and it's the church that has been exhorted to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And so again, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven are highlighting the seemingly insignificant beginning of Jesus and the 12 and how that would grow and birth into a massive kingdom. Now, fourth, if you're taking notes, jot this down. The parable of the dragnet. The parable of the dragnet. And this is really just a, a reiteration of the parable of the wheat and the tares. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers but the bad they threw away. So again, very similar to the wheat and the tares. Verse 49, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so again, there's an extended period of delay between the first coming of Christ and the judgment that will take place at the end of the age. That's the significance of the dragnet. That's the mystery that was not previously revealed. And now fifth, the parable of the scribe. The parable of the scribe, look at verse 51. It says, have you understood all these things? Jesus is talking to his disciples. They said to him, yes. Verse 52, and Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. You say, well, what's that about? Well, a scribe was an expert in what? Divine revelation. And at that time, what did divine revelation consist of? the Old Testament. And what was Jesus now doing? He was revealing new truths about the kingdom. Now, did these truths change the nature of the kingdom as revealed in the Old Testament? No. what they do? They revealed mysteries concerning an entire age that would take place between the two comings of Christ. And so what's the point of the parable? That a scribe, who has become a disciple of the kingdom will be like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old by remaining faithful to the revelation of the Old Testament and by grasping the mysteries of the kingdom as expressed in the New Testament. And so in a somewhat cryptic manner, 
Jesus affirms the teaching on the kingdom in the Old Testament and reveals new and complementary truths about the kingdom in the New Testament. And our job is to understand both, harmonize them, and understand how the entire dynamic comes together. So let me give you a brief summary of the five parables that we've seen here in Matthew 13. Jesus reveals that there will be an entire age between his first coming and the judgment that will immediately precede the establishment of his kingdom, thus requiring two comings of Christ. And during this newly revealed age, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to both a mustard seed and to leaven. But though the kingdom had a seemingly insignificant beginning, in the end, it will be a vast kingdom. And when you survey the last 2,000 years, what Jesus said would happen has happened. The gospel of the kingdom has continually gone forth, has continually produced new kingdom citizens, and has continually advanced the kingdom program and will continue to do so all the way to the second coming of Christ. That's Matthew 13 in a nutshell. Now, if there's anything that's remotely fuzzy, turn to Luke 19. Because Luke 19 is where we'll finish. And Luke provides for us a parable that Jesus taught that amazingly pictures reality as it is right now between the two comings of Christ and will help us to fill in the gaps as we think through the arrival of the kingdom of God. And what you're going to find is that this parable clearly depicts the period of time between the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ and his second coming. So we're going to read it. Luke 19, and it's verse 11 to 27. Luke 19, verse 11. And notice this first verse, incredibly insightful. While they were listening to these things, that is the disciples, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear what? Immediately. And what's the next event in Luke's gospel? It's the triumphal entry. So they've got some expectations here about the kingdom that are off. Verse 12. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, master, your mina, has made 10 minus more. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be in authority over 10 cities. Verse 18, the second came saying, your mina master has made five minus. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. Another came saying, master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief for I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank and having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, master, he has 10 minas already. Verse 26, I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given 
But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Verse 27, but these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Now it's possible that just in the reading of that parable, light bulbs are going off as the Lord gives this teaching. But if not, let's work through it and let's amplify what is being said in this parable. First, notice the basis for the parable. It's expressed in verse 11, where it says this, while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So again, the disciples have a faulty expectation surrounding the nearness of the kingdom of God. They believed the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. And so Jesus tells them this parable to correct their expectation surrounding the nearness of the kingdom. Verse 12, so he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. So let's break this down a little bit. Who does the nobleman represent? Christ. What does the distant country represent? Heaven. Who do the 10 slaves represent? Believers. What do the minas represent? I think we could say they represent the word of God or you could go beyond that and talk about spiritual giftedness or whatever it is, but it ties in to the word of God. And who do the citizens represent? Well, in a limited sense, they would refer to Israel, but in a broader sense, just to all unbelievers who don't want the noblemen to reign over him, over them rather. And so this parable pictures Christ going to heaven to receive his kingdom only to later return bringing his kingdom with him. And remember, the very reason Jesus is even telling this parable is to indicate a delay in the kingdom's arrival. The point of the parable is not to say that I'm going to heaven to reign and my kingdom starts then, because that wouldn't change the expectations surrounding the arrival of the kingdom. That would still be immediate. It would just move the kingdom to heaven. And so this means that his kingdom and its reign doesn't begin until he returns, at which time he will reward his people and judge the wicked. Are you tracking with that? Can I get some heads or no? And by the way, there is both biblical and historical precedent for this, for an individual, a, a king to be, going to a location to receive authority to reign and then returning to the place of his reign, where his reign begins upon his return. For example, it was normal practice for a prince of the Roman Empire to travel to Rome to receive his authority to reign, though his reign wouldn't begin until he returned. In fact, there's a historical example of this with Herod Archelaus and the Jews from 4 BC. And in fact, the Jews, when Archelaus went to Rome to receive his authority, went with him. There was a delegation that was sent to dog his steps and go to the emperor and say, we do not want this man to reign over us. So even as Jesus gives this parable, it has a historical relevance even to the Jews of that day. The biblical precedent for this comes in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel is given a vision, a vision of heaven. And in that vision, he sees the Son of Man approach God the Father to receive a kingdom. And here's Daniel's description. He says, I kept looking in the night vision 
And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And so Daniel's vision in Daniel 7 pictures the same reality that Jesus is describing in the parable in Luke 19. That at his ascension, he came up to the ancient of days and received his kingdom. But as with our parable, his reign doesn't begin until what? He returns. And so there's a gap between the receiving of a kingdom and the coming of the kingdom. Between the receiving of the kingdom and the arrival of the kingdom. And this continues to come out even as we work through this parable. Look at verse 15. When he, the nobleman, returned after receiving the kingdom, so look at that, the nobleman went away to a distant country to receive a kingdom and return. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. So the slaves, in the absence of the nobleman, had been given a very clear task. Each one had been given one mina. It's really important. There are 10 slaves and 10 mina. Each slave gets one mina. And they were to do business with this mina. And keep in mind that they were to conduct business in a somewhat hostile environment. Why was it a hostile environment? Because the citizens of that kingdom did not want the king who was going to come back and reign to rule over them. So the slaves were doing business on behalf of the noblemen and the citizens hate him. And if you're putting things together, that depicts the same age we're in now, where we are the slaves of Christ. And we've been given a task and responsibility to quote unquote, do business between the two comings of Christ during our earthly life. And we're to do that in the context of a hostile environment because we dwell in a world where the unbeliever hates Christ, hates God, and in fact, hates us. Verse 16, the first appeared saying, Master, your mina, one mina, has made 10 minas. So that slave took the one mina that was given to him and he did business with it and produced 10 minas. That's, an, that's a thousand percent increase. That's a massive increase. Think about your RSPs right now and what a thousand percent would look like. Massive increase. And then look at the pronouncement given to him, verse 17. And he said to him, well done, good slave. Because you have been faithful in a very little thing, you were to be in authority over 10 cities. Wow. That means the slave is going to what? Reign with the nobleman. The nobleman delegates to the slave authority to reign with him over 10 cities. And by the way, that parallels the promise that we will reign with Christ when he comes in his kingdom. Verse 18, the second came saying, your mina master has made five minas. Again, significant increase, 500%. And he too was given authority to reign with the nobleman. Look at verse 19. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. So the nobleman, on account of this slave's faithfulness, gives him authority to rule over five cities as he reigns with the nobleman. And then look at verse 20. Another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. 
For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. Verse 22, he said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, verse 24, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, master, he has 10 minas already. Verse 26, I tell you that everyone, that to everyone who has more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. So clearly, this third slave is not rewarded. Now, this is rather insignificant in the context of the overarching thrust of this parable. But this slave is never assigned judgment in the parable. This third slave, whom the nobleman refers to as unfaithful, no reference is made to this slave being slayed along with the enemies. And there's biblical precedent for that as well, of this unfaithful slave being a believer, though unfaithful. And the precedent for that is in 1 Corinthians 3, because there's a judgment that's depicted where every believer's works are gonna go into the fire and are gonna be tested in terms of the quality of their works and whether or not they built with the kind of material that will withstand the test of fire. Where it says in verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 3, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. And so there's precedent for a believer going before the judgment seat of Christ being deemed unfaithful, where there is no reward given to that saint, but nevertheless, they enter into eternal bliss. At the end of the day, what you do with that third slave doesn't materially change the overarching thrust of the parable. But notice the judgment in verse 27. It says, but these enemies of mine, this is the nobleman speaking. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Now, even this moment, I mean, this is the end of the age, right? Go back to the wheat and the tares, the, the dragnet. This is the end of the age. This is the day of judgment. The king is returned. He brings judgment. That means, in this case, the slaying of his enemies. And so all of this parallels what will happen to the tares at the second coming of Christ and the end of the age. So things should be crystallizing, and there should be wonderful continuity from where we began in the meta narrative all the way now to part six in the kingdom parables. Things should be coming together. But let me see if I can't bring this home for you a little bit. Jesus comes first to accomplish salvation through his death and resurrection. He then ascends to the right hand of the Father and receives his kingdom authority, even though he doesn't begin his reign until the time of his return. Instead, he reigns in heaven from the Father's throne over the universal kingdom and awaits that time when he will return to make his enemies a footstool for his feet. In the meantime, the kingdom advances through the preaching of the gospel as we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved son. And as we await the realization of our coming kingdom inheritance, and as we wait, we're tasked with a responsibility. And that responsibility is to put the word of God to work in both our lives and the lives of others. And at the judgment seat of Christ, 
will be assessed for our faithfulness. And it'll be on the basis of that faithfulness that we'll be given a measure of authority to reign with Christ when he comes with his kingdom. So what does that mean for you right now? What should you be all about right now? You should be all about putting the word of God into action, building upon the rock by being a doer of the word, Matthew 7. You should be all about spirit-empowered faithfulness to the word of God, where the word of God would permeate every sphere of your life, where every aspect of your life, every aspect of it would be governed by the word of God, where you would walk in a manner worthy of the gospel from your thought life all the way out to your business life. Everything ought to be done in faithfulness to the word of God. And if you are as serious as a heart attack to be spirit empowered in your faithfulness to God's word, then you are gonna be incredibly productive in this life. And when it ends, whether because the Lord returns or calls you home, he is going to be blessed by the work that you've done and is going to reward you with a measure of authority to reign with him in his kingdom. And so the application is to be faithful to the word of God, to be obedient to the word of God, to seek to spread the word of God in the lives of others, especially in the lives of those who are your immediate influence, to be a part of a local church that is engaged in taking the word of God to the nations and seeing the kingdom advance on that level so that your whole life is ultimately geared toward faithfulness to the word of God in every sphere. So what's next in the flow of our series on the kingdom of God? Well, next time, we'll be in Revelation 20. And what we're going to see is exactly what we would expect. In fact, we don't even need Revelation 20 to anticipate the kingdom depicted in that chapter. Everything already said, already laid out in the scriptures, anticipates Revelation 20. It's just the the cherry on top of a biblical theology of the kingdom of God. And so we'll look at that more closely next time as we continue this series on the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Well, Father God, we are so thankful to be able to have this time that we can all gather together in one place to sing together to sit under the preaching of your word, to meditate on the things above and the inheritance that you have set apart for us from before the foundation of the world. So Father, we give you great honor, glory, and praise and pray that you would empower us to be faithful in the little things, knowing that as we're faithful in the little things, you will be generous by rewarding us with much. And so help us, Father God, we pray and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.